Fresco, what is it? You're looking right now at Charles Lindbergh Elementary School's lucky addition into the world of Fresco by artist Charles Kapsner. Fresco is a dream come true for Mr. Kapsner, and we're going to center on that tonight during our live broadcast from Charles Lindbergh Elementary School. I'm Dave Gertz, the media technology specialist here at Lindbergh Elementary, and behind me you can see a work in progress with artist Charles Kapsner and his crew of talented artists who are making this fresco dream a reality for Charles Lindbergh Elementary School. In a few minutes, we're going to talk with artist Kapsner and his colleagues that you see behind me. But first, I'd like to take you through a little tour of what a fresco actually is. I'd like to give you some history of what the fresco is doing behind me and a little bit more about artist Charles Kapsner. Little Falls Public Elementary School, Lindbergh Elementary, was fortunate to have Charles Kapsner do a fresco project for us in October of 1994. You're going to see a videotape on that to describe exactly what the fresco process is, what art form it is, what it entails, and how special it is to have a fresco at an elementary school in the United States. And after that, we're going to talk with Charles a little bit about his idea for the fresco, how long he's been doing things, meet his crew, and then we're going to show you a run-through of what the first fresco project looked like in a speed tape that we have, and it looks great. One thing I know is that we're very fortunate to have a talented artist like Charles here doing this for us. We're going to break to a videotape right now that was taken uh, three years ago, 1994. That is four years ago, excuse me. <laughs> and we're going to show you what the Fresco Project looked like from its inception when Charles Lindbergh Elementary in Little Falls was added on to in 1993 to the completion in October of 1994 of the first Fresco Project. The first Fresco deals with Charles Lindbergh, of course, uh, the namesake of Little Falls, because Charles, the famous, famous aviator, was raised in Little Falls. And before he made his flight across the Atlantic, he got a lot of ideas for how he wanted to live his life from his stay in Little Falls. So we're going to run a tape right now and let uh, the great video show you what our first Fresco project was like. Off on a distant horizon, the object begins to take shape. First is nothing more than a clouded form. You move closer and closer, and it becomes clear. Its color, texture, and outline help define the image. It was in this way that famed aviator Charles A. Lindbergh, Jr. came to realize that stewardship of the Earth is the loftiest challenge facing the 20th century mind, one that only education and a sense of globalism can comprehend and resolve. In this way also, the art of fresco will be used to bring into focus the legacy and vision of Lindbergh, Little Falls' native son and modern Renaissance man, whose views and concerns were shaped by his own soaring encounters with unexplored horizons. Fresco is an art form that dates back to Egyptian and Greco-Roman times and achieved full flourish during the age of Italian masters like Giotto and Michelangelo. It involves painting earth-based pigments directly onto fresh lime plaster walls and is acclaimed for its lasting beauty. In fresco, the painting becomes the wall itself. The Lindbergh fresco is the first of two frescoes planned for the Little Falls School, named for the father of this American hero. Both will be painted by classically trained artist Charles Kapsner, who also hails from Little Falls and who is an acknowledged fresco master. Placement of these enduring works of art in a public school, an endeavor never before attempted, will make the frescoes a powerful educational tool for the school children who will pass by them every day. Lindbergh's encounter with the urgent need for a harmonious view of nature can, through the frescoes, become a similar encounter for these students, as well as for all others who journey to view this tribute. Lindbergh will be portrayed as elder statesman and philosopher, seated before a restful backdrop at his Hawaiian home, reflecting on his life. While the spirit of St. Louis will be part of the fresco and illustrate his acclaimed 1927 transatlantic solo flight and his interest in technology, other figures revolving around the central image of the tree will dominate the composition. Inspired by a photograph taken of one of Lindbergh's last flights over New England and portraying his point of view while in flight, 
The tree in this pivotal position resonates as an age-old symbol of life-giving and knowledge. At the same time, the tree's design evokes an image of a mushroom cloud, a depiction of what could be without restraints on nuclear science. Lindbergh's expansive outlook from the air, he said, led to his understanding that it's crucial to strive for a balance between technology and nature. Lindbergh's heartfelt views on stewardship were shaped by his encounters throughout the world. The fresco will capture some of these experiences. A family of elephants from Africa with their complex social order. A noble Maasai warrior offering knowledge of his world, yet striking a protective stance. Finally, a view of a teacher gesturing as if holding a sphere, thus alluding to lessons in global responsibility taught to children seated near her. The fresco will go up in this area right here, and then once we're done, there'll be these large panes of glass that'll sit in front of it, because this is gonna be a very well-traveled uh, corridor. Um, there'll be a, you know, lights placed back in here once it's completed, so as you're driving up Broadway, which is kind of hard to see right now, but actually this is probably a pretty interesting view of it, considering the tremendous amount of construction that is still going on. But as you come up Broadway at night, you will be able to see this fresco, which will make it a real uh, exciting piece. Located on a wall facing a major street in Little Falls, the fresco will be revealed by a bank of windows to all who pass by. No doubt glimpses of the fresco by townsfolk and visitors, even by the artist himself, will inspire them to take a closer look to encounter the steward's vision. Like any art form, frescoes suggest their own inspirations and reflect the perception of those who view them in different ways. The second fresco composition is still in the conceptual phase, but is planned to focus on the history of central Minnesota. Okay, this is going to be the large wall, the second of the two frescoes. Uh, this composition will take in sort of an overview of local history, which you know, not only pertains to Little Falls, but to central Minnesota. The fact of um, Native American culture, fur trading, lumbering, agriculture, I suppose it even taken dairy, the impact the Mississippi River's had on this area, the different nationalities that have settled here, um, and of course education. And one thing I'm gonna do is have at one point, you know, a group of children kind of watching us work on the project. And probably over in this corner right here, there'll be an actual vignette of the fresco team at work painting on it. So we'll start over from the left, coming this way, you know, with all of the different scenes, that being the most recent time. And we'll get back over here. This is where we'd be dealing with, um, I don't want to say antiquity because three, four hundred years ago really is not antiquity, but then you'll have the team up here. I mean, I envision Roger standing up on a piece of scaffolding, laying mud and, and the, the grinding table right here with the different people working and someone standing the drawing and then somewhere I'll be in the midst of all of this and maybe talking to children. I don't know what exactly, but that's sort of what I want to work out where the whole point of, of not only educating um, historically what we've done here, but also artistically and how and showing how we brought the children into the entire project not only the children but you know the whole community so this is going to be a very difficult task fresco technique is a disciplined painstaking process spanning several years it begins and ends with a mastery of drawing first with sketch studies then several compositional drawings and color studies onto full scale cartoons and yet another drawing called the sinopia than the actual style of painting itself. Performed by a team of skilled assistants, Technical aspects to fresco begin with creation of a lime pit to break down pure lime, preparation of an appropriate wall months ahead of time with reinforcement and a scratch coat of lime plaster, and a skillful troweling each day of a section of the final painting surface.
informed and inspired by an acutely intimate knowledge of every detail of the composition, a command of color and drawing skill, an appreciation of themes, and a love for his craft, the artist will persevere until the task is accomplished. Well, I, I love his work, for one thing. I really like the, the, uh, the artistic quality of the work that he does. But also, I love the fact that Charles, unlike some artists, um, is still very, he's very tied into the community. He's very compassionate. He's very interested in using his art to help other people carry out some of the things that they'd like to do. I love the fact that he's all, he always he comes back. If he's in Italy or he's teaching somewhere around the country, and he has an extraordinary reputation now in many, many places. But he always comes back to Little Falls, and he's very willing and of course with his talent to, to enhance any of the projects that Laura Jane might have or the Historical Society or the Lindbergh Fund. His, his generosity and his talent combined, I think, make him a really unusual artist. Public enthusiasm for the fresco is solid and growing. The project will be completed without local tax dollars. Support from individuals, corporations, and foundations is necessary for success. Won't you become a part of an endeavor that will become an enduring credit to Central Minnesota, the community of Little Falls, and recognition of a steward who braved new horizons and brought them into focus? We are live here at Charles Lindbergh Elementary School. My name is Dave Gertz. I'm the Media Technology Coordinator here at Lindbergh. We're doing a fresco project here at Lindbergh Elementary. And this is a live broadcast. And we're going to try something with the public who's out there. We hope you're watching, flipping through some channels on public access. Channel 6, Channel 63, and Channel uh, 3 and Piers. We have a number for you to call if you want to ask questions about the fresco project, about uh, Charles's work, or anything else. The number you can see on your screen is 320-616-3240. And that's a Little Falls number. And it's long distance if you might be out in the Uppsala area, but uh, it's a short distance call if you're in the Little Falls area. And we've got someone manning the phone right now, too. I'm going to take you up a little bit uh, back here because I'd like to introduce you to the artist, Charles Kapsner, and his crew. And I'm going to pass the mic to the crew in just a few seconds. But uh, Charles. Yes. How are you? Good. How do you like public access TV, Charles? It's kind of interesting. <laughs> I, I enjoy it. It's, it's a good thing for the community and, and just for education, for the country, etc. I think it's wonderful. It really is. What's really nice about this is doing this live, I think the public gets a chance to see what's happening in our schools with our technology integration that we're trying to do. Charles, before we start talking with you, I'd like you to first introduce your crew. And I'm going to give the mic to each of them just to have them introduce themselves and talk a little bit about themselves. And we'll start with Beth right here. Hello. I'm helping Chuck with the colors. Um, came up from St. Cloud to to assist him, and it's been a challenge. It's uh, my first time coming up with different combinations of colors, as you can see, picking out with um, the help of Mark, my assistant. Um. <laughs> uh, don't worry, this is live broadcast to <laughs> thousands of people, Beth. Oh, really? That, that was Beth Adams, Charles' assistant. I'm going to turn the mic over right here to Mark Spangenberg. Mark, can you tell us about yourself and turn around and look at the camera? I do. I'm Mark Spangenberg. I come from uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, and I met Chuck and everyone else, and Roger and Beth, back in 92 at the Charlotte Nations Bank uh, fresco. And I did also, also work on the last one here. Anyway, um, it's been a privilege to be here, and uh, of course, it's been real hard work. Anyway. Idiot. Thank you. We're going to talk with you later about some of the hazards of the fresco work. And right over to my right is Roger Nelson. Come here, Roger. Hi. Uh, I've worked with Chuck quite a bit on frescoes all the way back to uh, St. Peter's Church in Charlotte. We've done quite a bit. I'm also one of Beth's assistants on this project. so. 
I help her with colors and I help Chuck with almost everything we can do. I'm originally from Minnesota, although I've lived down in North Carolina for 16 years now. Thank you very much. Now, Charles, back to you. Okay. One thing you've got to wonder uh, about, Charles, is uh, this fresco project is a mammoth undertaking. Where in the world did you get training and the idea and uh, the desire to do this massive project? Tell us about this one for just a few minutes. Well, this particular piece that uh, is behind me is, measures 18 feet by 41 feet, so it is a rather mammoth piece in relationship to the one downstairs, which is uh, 9 by 26 feet. The whole idea for this began, I suppose, about... Uh, must have been in 1991 when the building project began and I was approached by several uh, people on the school board and, and um, Carrie Jacobson about the possibility of returning home and doing a fresco here. I had uh, spent a lot of time in Florence, Italy working with frescoes back uh, since 1974 actually working with a friend of mine, Ben Long. From Italy we went to North Carolina and now here. But uh, back on this project, it's something that it's taken a long time to get to this point. The first one was finished, as uh, was mentioned earlier, in 1994. This is 1998, so we're doing the first part of this particular piece. Again, uh, measures 18 by 41 feet. This particular part that we're dealing with now has the background of the uh, city, while well, the dam, you can see the dam, a bit of Maple Island. It kind of moves from winter into the spring and uh, what's interesting about it is it's an allegorical piece so when one uses the term allegorical piece or you get into that concept I'm taking things that are familiar to us but I'm sort of making and putting them into sort of a dreamlike world and putting you know winter together with spring and then the, the massive figures that are going up behind me right now the first one which you can kind of see right here is the um, lumberjack and by the size of them you can see that he's considerably larger than I am so the the figures up front are quite massive and what we have portrayed here are different uh, peoples uh, different professions that sort of brought us to this area several centuries ago going back to the Native Americans then to uh, fur trading the explorers coming down the Mississippi uh, the lumbering industry the railroad uh, nursing agriculture and certainly education so those are some of the figures that are depicted on this wall that's immediately behind me, which is a 7 by 10 foot section, just this piece where the, the massive figures are. Um, I mean, I chose these figures because they probably take into account some of the major uh, reasons why we're here. There certainly are many, many more, and, and again, in an allegorical piece, I'm trying to tell the story. I can't tell every story that has occurred in this area, but we're through symbolism and one particular individual will represent what that whole story is. And so there will be an interpretive statement that goes along with this fresco talking about the different things that occurred within the context of each of those subject, uh, that, that subject matter. I guess it kind of takes in a lot of it. I don't know. <laughs> Charles, that's real esoterical if you want, you know. That's great. I think it's a great tribute to uh, your vision and what you want to do for the kids at Lindbergh School. But Charles, I want to ask you a couple questions. Uh, we didn't even tell the audience what Fresco is. Where did Fresco come from? What is your experience with Fresco? You mentioned uh, studying in Italy, but can you explain to us what a Fresco actually is? Well, Fresco is, is a particular approach to painting. Uh, many people refer to large wall paintings as murals. That is correct. Fresco just happens to be one way of producing a mural. It is the, it's the medium, like oil painting or tempera, etc. But the difference between fresco and the other mediums is the fact that there's a fresh piece of plaster laid each day before we begin painting. And what we lay down that day, we go from start to finish because the colors are absorbed into the wall themselves. The colors are uh, mineral pigments, uh, earth pigments, etc. They're uh, ground down with distilled water. The substructure of the wall, which is underneath my hand right here, is roughly about an inch and three quarter thick and uh, that was put up over the last year and a half. It's actually been curing for about the last year. And this layer right here it w was laid down today. I color tint and then I get into the painting end of it. The substructure is two parts sand to one part lime. This is one part sand to one part lime. It's a fatter mixture. And um, as it starts to set up, it will accept moisture. So basically what we're doing is we're you know, color tinting the wall uh, for a lack of better terms. The medium itself probably goes back to the ancient Egyptians with the tomb paintings and then on into the Roman or Greek Roman period. And certainly during the Renaissance, it reached its, its maximum height as far as art history is concerned. Most famous piece being the uh, uh, Michelangelo Sistine Chapel, The Last Judgment, and also I'd like to, since I'm commenting on the Renaissance, contrary to popular belief, Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper 
is not a fresco. It is a mural, it's a wall painting. He did it much like a temporal oil panel, and that is why it has deteriorated to the state it has. So uh, many people think that The Last Supper is a fresco. It is, in fact, not a fresco. My own experience with fresco began back in 1973 when I first went to Florence, Italy. My interest was to learn a good understanding of drawing, basic drawing skills, etc. And in addition to that, I was curious about fresco painting. And I was going to a school that uh, I was studying conservation because the school offered simultaneous translation from Italian into English. I did not speak Italian at the time, so I found it was a good way for me to get into the whole educational system in Italy. So our main focus actually was conservation, was uh, cons conserving of frescoes because I was there in 1973 shortly after the flood of 1966. So I had a great opportunity to see them up close. Shortly after being in Florence also, I met Ben Long, fellow American painter who was there for the same reasons, trying to find a good art education in the grand tradition. And that really sort of speaks of the type of work we do. When he got his first, uh, one of his first fresco projects in Montecatini Termine, asked if I'd be interested in assisting and the rest is sort of history. From there we went to Monte Cassino, to North Carolina, here, back to Carolina. So over the last, since, well, 1974, I've worked on many, many different fresco projects uh, in Italy, North Carolina, and here in Minnesota. Well, you know, Chuck, uh, we've known you in Little Falls for many years. You uh, grew up in Little Falls. Did that have anything to do with your deciding to do something for Charles Lindbergh Elementary School? I know that you're interested in Lindbergh in particular, right. so maybe you want to talk about the first fresco downstairs that we saw the videotape about. And uh, don't forget, people, this is a live broadcast. If you'd like to call in and ask Chuck some questions or anything about the fresco, just look at the number on your screen right now. It's 320-616-3240. That's a Little Falls number. And feel free to call. We have Diana on the helm right now at the phone. But Charles, for you, Little Falls, what's significance? Well, it's interesting. I think uh, for a lot of people, I can speak for myself, there comes a time when you sort of uh, want to run away from everything. And uh, that's exactly what I did when I graduated from high school. I went to St. Cloud, and then from there went to Italy. And I lived in Italy from 1973 to 1981. Um, but as time rolls on, you find that the peace and quiet of a small town really offers you know, just exactly that, peace and quiet. I mean, I'm used to living in large cities. I, as I mentioned, lived in Florence for many years. I lived in Paris for several years, Los Angeles. So I've had my taste of the big city life, and I continue to go back and forth to those. But I like to come back here because of the friends that I have had for the last 30, 35 years. And also, it's given me an opportunity through education to bring something back to the community with what this Fresco project is. Fresco is something that, going back to the Renaissance, really dealt with education because many people in those days were not uh, literate. So in the churches, for instance, that was how the priest on Sunday would talk about the Gospels, talk about the lives of the saints, etc. So when the opportunity arose to do this project here at this school, I felt it was really a timely situation because, again, like I mentioned, Fresco is an educational medium. And so downstairs with the stewardship, we talk about Lindbergh's vision and what really came about in his life after the flight. Everyone knows about the flight and the kidnapping and some of his controversial views during World War II, etc. But it's really what happened after, uh, I think, a fine book written in, uh, that was published actually in 1972 called The Autobiography of Values really discussed a lot of what you see in the piece downstairs, again, dealing with conservation and our duty to take care of the environment. It deals with education, which is one of the new focuses of the fund itself. You know, Charles, uh I'm impressed with your uh, vision for what Charles Lindbergh had. I know the kids at Lindbergh School are very impressed at what's been happening downstairs. We're going to do a videotape uh, of what happened on the fresco downstairs. Now, what you see behind you, like Charles said, is a massive undertaking. The fresco behind us is going to be huge, and it's not going to be a one-year project. It's going to be a many-year project, as Charles is going to tell us in a minute. But the fresco downstairs, we had the opportunity to do a time-lapse tape of, and we're going to show that tape, and I'm going to have Charles kind of describe what happens during the fresco process. As he mentioned, the wall behind you was set up over the last year, and the lime was set to dry. Well, Charles was working downstairs in 1994 for the stewardship fresco, we took a videotape, and he's going to do some commenting on that videotape. And Charles, you can see it on the monitor in okay. front of you. If you can run through what happened, and the faithful assistants were there, just about all the people that were here were there. I was there. I was behind the camera. And it's a wonderful process to see the videotape that you're about to see. And uh, Jerry's going to start that in just a second. Here we go. 
What's happening right here? Okay, this is what it looks like in the very early part. You can see the very first thing that happens is Roger comes in and lays the fresh piece of plaster that we're going to work on that day, and that's what you see going on right here. Of course, it's happening in very quick mode and fashion. Uh, we're doing the portrait of Charles Lindbergh. Um, it is one that I used from a photograph that was taken the last, uh, well, actually, this was not the last time he was in Little Falls, but it was uh, a very lovely photograph that's on the back of the book I mentioned earlier that was taken by his uh, former son-in-law, Mr. Brown, I believe his name was. Now uh, you're seeing things happen in very quick order. That's called a compitura, the color coat that was put up on the wall. You saw tracing go on there quickly. We're putting more flesh colors on. And as I mentioned earlier when we had broadcast this out to the students a couple weeks ago, I wish each day did go this fast. <laughs> Unfortunately, sometimes they will last uh, well into the evening. We've been very lucky so far in this one where we've not had uh, any uh, late, late nights. Uh, I just came back from Charlotte, North Carolina, where we had done a dome at the Transamerica building. And some of those evenings went till 1 AM, so that does get long. But again, here you just sort of see the base colors being laid in on the portrait. Um, I approached today's piece a little bit differently. I didn't get into that whole chiaroscuro underpainting you see me doing at this particular point. I went right into the flesh colors and I'm tapping them down. But now I'm putting the lights in. I was putting the lights in. And um, again, in quick fashion, there they go. There now you start to see the highlights come onto Lindbergh's face. He's starting to pop off the wall. And that white line you see on the right of his shoulder will disappear as the day goes on. That's where the day line is, or giornata, as it's called in Italian. Again, the uh, running it in fast fashion, I've got to just sort of keep in mind what is going on here. <laughs> what was this, a 12-minute piece or something like that? <laughs> this was, uh, we're going to ask you how long this actually did well, take. Well, the whole day went on to, uh, I think it was about a 12 or 14-hour day, because I think Roger came in about 6.30, 7 o'clock that morning to lay the plaster, and I know it was uh, quite late in the evening when we got out that day. Um, it was just a real um, interesting day, it got a little stressful after a while. We had the wall was kind of acting up and then it'd start kicking off again. See, the whole drying process that goes on with the wall, like I mentioned earlier, it will start to accept moisture, but there is a point where sometimes it might get a little saturated and you've got to let the wall rest and then know when to come back into it. And uh, that's something that uh, you won't see on the tape. There's Roger touching up the day mark, as I mentioned, that will get touched up. It is amazing to see that in this motion, because you can see the process that it took to get that wonderful face to come to life. Well, the other thing I want you all to take, also take notice of all the people that are around. I mean, fresco is not something that, you know, uh, cer certainly I, without the, the help of uh, these wonderful artists, there's no way that I could feasibly put up something like this because of the tremendous amount of work that goes into this. And it truly is a team effort. It's very much like being in, uh, well, a musical group, uh, nothing else. And everyone has, sort of has their instrument that they play. I happen to be the composer of this. And, and uh, that's sort of where I stand on it. And uh, Roger has helped me get the thing gridded up on the wall, as did Mark. And uh, then the colors are being mixed. Uh, the lime was ground. The wall was prepared earlier by some people from Little Falls. So it does take uh, a lot of uh, time for one day just to happen. You sit down and think of, if I'm here painting for 8, 10, 12 hours, well, the people that are here also for that, if not longer, so there might be easily 70, 80 hours just to put this piece up behind me. I mean, I'll stand to the side so you can see him a little bit better. He's not finished yet, and uh, it looks like a decapitated soul hanging up there. Tomorrow we're going to do the arm and the axe, and, and then on Sunday I'd like to make mention that uh, my good friend Mr. Ben Long is coming into town this evening and he's going to be spending four days to, to visit the project. This will be a second visit to Little Falls. And there's a vignette down on my left, which is kind of hard to see, but it's of me actually painting this wall. And he's going to paint that piece for me. So it, it's sort of like finally this whole thing that started 25 years ago has gone full circle where I went to Italy, worked with him, and then went to North Carolina. And I've been here. I also have done a small fresco in Italy. and one in North Carolina, so now Ben is coming up here to paint on this, so historically it's a very important situation that we'll have a little bit of Ben Long in the corner here also, because as far as I'm concerned, he's the world's greatest fresco painter, and, and uh, people are invited to come by on Sunday afternoon. We're going to have the east door open if you'd like to see what he's doing and, and uh, chat with him if there's a free moment, but um, he'll be here both Sunday and Monday in the school building, so it should be an exciting time. Let me mention once again, this is live from Little Falls, Charles Ludmer Elementary School. 
Uh, if you want to call, ask any questions of Charles, the number you can see on your screen is 320-616-3240. That's a local call. That's a Little Falls number. And uh, Ben Long is on his way as I get a, got a call from him this afternoon to make sure he was getting picked up at the airport. And That's I know right. he will be here. Um, we're going to show, we're going to pan down to that a little later in the broadcast, but right now I'd like to talk to some of your artist cohorts, and uh, I see that Mark is mixing some paint right here. Beth is going to set something up here. Let's talk to Beth just for a second, and uh, Beth, can you tell us, first of all, your interest in the fresco and what you are about to do right now? Okay. Well, I'm trying to pick out a blue flesh color. I'm, Rogers has excellent notes, so I've been pouring through those, trying to come up but something in Mark over here is mixing up more of a greenish flesh color. So that's what we're working on now because he's doing the portraits and we need to get those in order. And we just did the base color for the shirt, which is a pretty Mars violet. Well, you can't really see it. But, um, so that's what I'm doing, organizing colors. Um, I think the greatest part is, as I've watched this, the people have just been doing their thing, and it all comes together at the very end, and I think that's really great. Uh, Mark, let me uh, take you just for a second. What's, uh, let me get in front of you here. Can you tell me what's going on with you right now in the mixing bowl? Well, just like Beth said, I'm mixing up a, a large quantity of a green, greenish flesh tone, which will mm. go in the rest of the portraits. And, uh, you know, of course, there's a lot of concentration there of uh, just well, getting it right, making it consistent. And because uh, um, you're working with maybe two or three different colors. You need to add a little bit together. of white to it to stabilize and, it. And uh, so anyway. Because the ultramarine, you know. I'll get this finished day, and uh, funky hopefully we'll have enough for uh, but yeah, try it out. the rest of them. That's just great. You know, it, it looks wonderful. I mean, I used to love to do paint and play in paint, but I couldn't do that. Can I want to move back? All right. We're going to show him working just for a second as he's mixing that paint. How long does that paint last before it dries out? Do you have to use it real fast? Uh, you have to keep it covered because what you're using here uh, is just straight pigment and just distilled water. And also what we have in here also added as a white, we're using a uh, mold lime, aged lime, and this particular lime is from uh, Zecchi in, from Italy, and that, of course, that's, it whitens out. Of course, it's going to be considerably a lot lighter uh, when it gets onto the wall than what you see now. So when you're mixing, you also have to consider that this color is going to lighten up considerably, and some pigments do have a tendency to uh, lighten up or lighten up more or be uh, a little bit stronger than others, so that's something else you have to uh, concentrate on while mixing. Well, that's great. Once again, we are live here at Lindbergh Elementary. You can dial 616-3240 if you want to ask some questions of Charles or any of the artists right here. I'm going to talk with uh, one of the great men around here, too. Of course, everybody here is wonderful. When I met these people four years ago, it was just great to know the neat people you have in the world. This is Roger Nelson, and Roger, I'm going to ask you what we did with the kids when they were here. Tell us about the dangers of working with the lime. Ah, uh, yes, the dangers of working with the lime. Uh, in the very beginning, the lime is very uh, volatile. It, uh, it comes out of the ground uh, that's crushed into powdered form. We initially mix it with water. It uh, rises to a temperature of about 400 degrees very quickly and has a tendency to burn you all over the place. So you dress up and you go about it and you bury it into a pit for at least two years. That's the main thing. Um, when it goes on the wall, it, it's, uh, it's not that dangerous any longer. It's, uh, it's a little bit hard on your hands. I always wear rubber gloves when I work on the wall. But actually the pigment, grinding the pigment, is just as bad on your hands as anything else. Um, fresco is a very sensitive medium, and so the substructure, what the wall is consisted of, is very important. The actual laying of the lime, we found out in years um, through the last four or five projects, at least I have, is that uh, some of the old traditional methods are the best methods. Uh, we started out by uh, working with a plasterer down in North Carolina who would uh, 
mix it with a drill and a paddle bit and, and everything seemed fine, but it wasn't quite right. And finally, on this project, and Charles has been struggling with his, his walls ever since we've done them here in Minnesota, we finally went back to hand mixing the lime and uh, going back to the old books and reading about how it was. And, and the hand mixing of the lime made all the difference in the world, uh, keeping it very stiff and the process of applying it becomes very crucial. If you don't have the right uh, lay of the plaster, then the plaster is not uh, accepting the water. And if it doesn't accept the water, then it doesn't accept the paint. And so everything is real critical, something so simple that we really overlooked. We got into the technical painting part, the drawing part. We tended to forget about that. And so we've come around Chuck was saying full circle, we're back to Italy as far as how to mix the lime as well. You know, I was asking you before about the uh, lime mixture too. Charles said that this coat, the original coat of lime was about an inch and three quarters. And uh, he also mentioned that you can only put up so much during the day. Can you explain why that happens? I know Chuck mentioned that a little bit ago. Why can you only put a little section up and not just do the whole thing, cover it up and let it go? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's basically, it takes, eight to 12 hours for it to go from the beginning when you first lay the lime onto the wall, the plaster onto the wall until it stops taking the, the paint. And so what you do is you try to decide how much you can accomplish in that eight to 12 hour period. They're called the day marks. Uh, it starts in the beginning when we did, uh, if they pan up to the sky up above me, um, you can see a great big huge blue section of sky above the clouds. Well, that, that was taken on in one day. Uh, a massive amount of plaster was laid and basically an even coat of cerulean blue, uh, darker at the top, moving down into some, some cerulean blue with white. Uh, the second day was basically the whole cloud formation and a lighter blue underneath. Um, now, at the end of that day, at the end of every day, we apply an extra six inches of plaster. If you look right next to Chuck, you see kind of a, a golden area. This plaster will be trimmed away at the end of the day to form what's called our day mark line. Um, so basically, when you do a fresco, you are planning it out. You plan your whole picture ahead of time. All the drawing is done months and years in advance sometimes. Um, everything to fit into the large picture. But when you actually get to the painting of it, you, you take it apart like a puzzle. You start to put it together. You start at the top and you work down. All the figures that he's drawn have been uh, drawn from life and then blown up into a scale drawing. Usually one inch equals a foot. Um, that um, over here is an example. Right here of the scene that we're working on right now, which is the damp. This is all done in a scale drawing to fit onto the wall. This being one inch equals a foot, transferred up to the wall behind us, which is a grid, which is one foot square. So that's how the painting is done. Um, all the colors are decided in advance. Uh, Charles's method of painting is to go out and do landscapes from life, and then to bring it back in the studio and refine these ideas, and then uh, so that is the guide. Over here on the other side of us, behind Beth, we have our, our uh, color panel, our test panel. I don't know if you can see that or not. Um, that billboard might be in the way. Um, that panel is put on with flesh, fresh plaster most, almost every day. And um, what is done with it is that you put on the colors wet onto the wall. The reason we do that is because the colors come up in key probably as much as uh, uh, they lighten up, oh, I don't know exactly the word, but they, they become much lighter when they dry. And so the process of mixing and blending the color has to be tested ahead of time so that when we put it onto the wall, it's, uh, it goes on much darker and consequently we have to wait and be patient for it to dry up. So all this goes into fresco, and uh, that's what we do. That's a great explanation. Have you ever thought of being on TV? Yeah. <laughs> 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 
we're going to do, we're going to get a real wide shot of the fresco right now. And you know what I'd like to do is, Charles, can you talk a little bit about this fresco? Then I'm going to ask you about the one downstairs. Uh, Roger mentioned that you're using actual life figures from people that you know. Could you care to tell us who some of these people are that we can see, and uh, what's the tie to why you chose them, maybe for a look, for the community tie, and uh, maybe give us the name if you don't feel, uh, if you feel comfortable with that. Tell us who these people are. Okay, well, I guess we'll start with the person that I'm painting right now is an old friend of mine uh, from many, many years ago, Mike Gammon, who um, has that sort of rough look of a, a lumberjack, and he's going to have a checkered shirt on. And um, I felt that uh, you know, not only would he make a good lumberjack, but I'm thinking down the road for some great religious composition because he's got the great head of a saint, so I've got <laughs> to come up with uh, some church somewhere too, so uh, keep your ears open. Um, next is, uh, kind of hard to see here, is John Wagner. Let me get, I'm going to grab these things out of the way. There, yeah, there you go. And um, he's the fur trader. And again, for those of you who know Mr. Wagner, our teacher at the middle school, uh, this was a really an appropriate uh, character for him to be. Then behind, I've just sort of got it lightly sketched in. It's rather difficult to see. Uh, this is called a Sinopia drawing, by the way, this red drawing or wash you see on the wall. It serves two functions. One is to show us what the composition looks like on the wall, and then also it's our guideline for where we lay the plaster each given day is our day marks. There's a better shot. So this person, being the nurse, is a friend of mine, uh, Paulette Papp, who years ago wanted to be a nurse. I, it's really funny, I just sort of picked her. I said, Paulette, I've got a job for you. I, she was going to be in the center part of the fresco holding the French flag, but then I said, nah, I think I'll have you be the nurse. And she said, well, you know, I always wanted to be a nurse when I was a kid. I said, well, good, you get a chance to play the nurse on the wall here, you know? <laughs> Then my uh, best friend, Michael Kretschy, who I grew up with, he has a great interest in trains, and so he's the train engineer in, in the fresco, and actually the, the prominent figure in the front. You can see he's holding an oil can and a wrench and all that. Two figures that are not in there yet, one is a school teacher. Uh, that's uh, Kim West uh, modeled for that, and then there is the uh, farmer who's not in there, Dr. Jacobson. Uh, modeled for that, and then the Indian maiden Nancy Sakala, who um, is also an artist and lives just across the street here, and has a real strong, you know, that kind of look, Polynesian or, or Native does. American look. And so I chose, you know, these people because of, of a look they had, but they represent something. So even though I've just mentioned who they are, they really, in this project, on this wall, are not who they are. They are and represent something, much like during uh, the Renaissance or the Baroque period or any great period of art, when you do an allegorical painting, religious painting, you choose someone who has a particular look that you're looking for, and then they become that character. So these people are used to be this character, you know. So you, you still might want to say, um, oh, that's Mr. Wagner in the wall, whatever it is. But no, he's a fur trader. That's, that's his role in this particular picture. It's like a little movie production from that standpoint. But what's unique about this project versus the one downstairs is that all of the people that will be in this as far as the cast characters in the center holding the flags, I'm not sure how many will be there, and children playing, they will all be people from the community. They will all you know, re represent a nation or something uh, uh, that goes on. And, and that's what will be interesting, even though, like I said, they no longer sort of are who they are. They're this character. I mean, yeah, this is Mike Gammon, but he's a lumberjack. you know. So that's the fun and interesting thing for you know, generations to come, that there'll be recognizable faces. And that's true of any museum that you'd go to, like if you were living in the 1700s and happened to see who uh, uh, some of the models for the different artists were there, you'd walk through, the, walk through the church, for instance, and see the Madonna and say, well, that was my friend so-and-so up there is the Madonna, you know, so. <laughs> but that's just the way it is in, in, in the art world, so. And it's great to do it from life, where downstairs I had to rely a lot on photographs and put together a photo collage, so this has a whole different strength of drawing to it than the one downstairs. The million dollar question, Charles. The fresco you see behind us, how long is it going to take to complete this? Well, we're hoping that we can have it completed by year 2000. We will take a third each year. And of course, it's, it's largely based on how uh, our fundraising efforts go, which you know, the money's come through private individuals, uh, service clubs, businesses, and grants from foundations, etc. So that is the, some of the background work that you know has gone on over the over the years and um, it, we've been very fortunate that we've had the uh, the local support has been wonderful um, and, and uh, I, I can't speak enough for that and then of course with the uh, the different foundations around uh, the state and actually even out of the state 
that have supported this project because they see what we're doing, the uniqueness of it, and the fact that we're doing it in an elementary school is something that has kind of really taken people back like, wow, but you know, the, the children have been really um, just incredible. They're just a lot of fun to see their reaction, the, the pride and the ownership that they take in this piece, especially what like uh, Mrs. Uh, Ratzloff has done in the art classes. The children have a real understanding of what we're doing here, but it's also sparked their interest into the other things like the environment and certainly if you were here four years ago for the dedication of this building, the whole interest in Lindbergh, etc. Was, was a lot of fun. Uh, what plays an important role in this particular project is that this being Lindbergh School is a K through five uh, elementary and, and so a lot of people don't have a tie-in yet to history or they might know grandma, grandpa or some of their background, but at least this fresco we're going to try and tell the story of central Minnesota and the community so people will, you know, an interest will be sparked prior to them going to middle school, which is sixth grade with social science and Minnesota history starting at that point. They will have at least some sort of sense of, of their background prior to going there because they'll come and say, oh, you know, I know so-and-so or whatnot. Or, uh, there'll be, like again, the, the interpretive statement, the teachers bring the students in here and use this as, a, as an educational tool. So, you know, we're assisting in that respect to open the minds up that way a little early on where a family that doesn't necessarily know their background might feel inclined to investigate their background and know more about their, their beginnings, their origins, etc. I think that's wonderful. Uh, one thing, too, we do live broadcast this to other places. The other day, uh, Tuesday, we broadcast this to Neoshing, Uppsala, and Swanville, and we had the interview with you, which I thought went very well, and it's another tool that we can use to mm -hmm. take technology out of here and into the classroom, and we will have the lucky uh, fact of having this in our building forever and for posterity. I want to ask you a couple more questions, Charles. Uh, the downstairs fresco, how many painting days did that take? Just actual physical painting after all the wall was set up and everything. Mm, I think 19 days to paint it. Um, that was after a year and a half of you know preparation. Uh, I think I spent uh, way too much time on the full scale drawing, <laughs> considering <laughs> the fact that it took 19 days to, to paint it. You know, the, the painting again sometimes becomes the sort of anticlimax where you've spent months and sometimes years to put a project together. We um, uh, had done one at Nations Bank down in Charlotte, North Carolina back in 1992 that we began the preparatory work over in Paris in uh, 1990 and worked for almost uh, two years before we came on location to paint and, and in three and a half months we're, uh, we're finished. And, and, uh, but the, the, the painting part is really the grueling end. I mean, it, 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 uh, it tests you physically in a way that you can't imagine, and that's probably one of the reasons why there's not a lot of fresco painting going on today is that, first off, it takes a, a dedicated team of artists to, to come together to put something like this together, but then the hours are long. I mean, it's not a nine to five situation five days a week. Uh, that that, uh, that kind of goes out of the ballpark when you begin these. They, they own you, you know, so. Uh, <laughs> I can't wait to get this done so I can get a life. <laughs> I seem to recall one uh, unfortunate event with the fresco downstairs. Uh, the center fi figure, Peel, the uh, overseer of nature and everything, something happened with the fresco, part of that, the paint. And what did you have to do to that lovely figure one day? I have it on tape if you want to see it. Oh, yes. Well, someone asked, uh, if you make a mistake, do you erase it? <laughs> yeah, we do, all right. We take and cut the wall out all together. So what happens is um, you take a... Uh, uh, plaster tool or pallet knife and you remove that day's uh, painting which it gets rather frustrating because sometimes it's later on in the day when you realize that uh, it didn't go right or sometimes you get up the next morning and come on site and you go like oh my god what happened there you know while well, I was gone someone must have touched it up <laughs> and uh, so we ended up uh, cutting it out. I remember there were some people that left town for a couple days thinking, God, they're going through this thing really great, and they came back, and not only was the part that, that they left that we were painting, but everything was gone, you know, and we started right from scratch again. No. It is frustrating, but um, it's really the only way. I mean, if you're really um, honest, you know, with yourself and sincere about what you're doing and creating as an artist, you're not going to, you know, second guess yourself. You're not going to have something up to that isn't of the quality you expect it to be and, and you know every time we do a fresco there's a little glitch here and there and, and if it's a major glitch it gets cut out if it's a minor one we'll retouch it in egg tempera so uh, that's kind of what we hold ourselves to and, and, and many changes happen over six eight months on these and again uh, was mentioned earlier about the paint changing that's why you saw the test panel anytime we uh, add white to a color it lightens up tremendously so we have to pre-test everything and sometimes on the wall they may react differently than they do in a little test swatch because that's a little test swatch and I have a huge area behind me. So there will be variables and we just have to, you know, 
know those variable, variables as best as possible, or hope we do. I think that's wonderful. Again, uh, what a treat to have this here in our building, too. One thing I'd like to ask you again before we do, uh, if there's any phone calls coming in, we have a number to call if you want to call us live. It's 320-616-3240. After we're done in about five more minutes, I believe, we're going to cut out for good. But I'll give you the website address where you can visit Charles's first fresco online. And I'll just tell that you maybe got a piece of paper and pencil to take that down. Charles, the painting time for the fresco downstairs, 19 actual painting days. This fresco has been in the works for many years. How many painting days do you think you have left if you just painted it straight through right now, plastered it all up, and made it work? Oh, you mean on the whole, the whole thing? On this one right here, yes. Oh, just this section? Yes. I actually just whole, on this section. The whole fresco. Uh, no, I think the whole fresco. I'd like to see how long it would take. Oh, boy. We don't know. Roger's saying 46 days. 40, 40 to 60, 60 days. Well, I mean, yeah, it, it would easily be in that area because we just did a dome down in North Carolina. Uh, ben Long did, and we assisted him on that. And, and I had, uh, as one would say, guesstimated between 45 and 60 days, and I think there were actually 52 painting days on that. So I was in the ballpark. This one here, today is um, uh, day six, I believe, yes. And, and so that's actually, you know, moving quite a ways. But again, when you have these massive areas, we just really attacked it. And the beauty of, of fresco in something of that size is that it's a very fast, quick medium, much like watercolor in many respects. And you can also really play with the lime, and then, and, and which is, uh, you know, comes through and again will really come up and dry out as time goes on. But now things are going to slow down. And so we still have two weeks left on this uh, because, I mean, there's, granted, there's a big area behind this portrait. But as we move now through here, It'll be like, you know, one portrait a day and maybe some, you know, part of the torso and then, of course, the hand. So we haven't actually calculated out because what we were really doing was trying to get down to this point for when Ben came here because we just had a very limited window of opportunity for when he could be here because he's heading back to France. He lives in the south of France, and so he's going back on June 8th. So we kind of have worked right down to this area just knowing how long it was going to take us to get right here. Now, uh, over the weekend... Monday, we'll sit down and, and take a, a serious look at how many actual painting days are left. So like I said, today's day six. Tomorrow will be the arm, just the arm, which has got a very complex checkered pattern, his hand and ax. That, that would be, uh, uh, what is today, Thursday? This is Thursday, correct. So so that'd be day seven. See, like I said, we forget. You know, we've been <laughs> at this too long. <laughs> and uh, OK, this will be day seven painting. Day eight will be you know, myself standing against the wall, which actually, for when you do come to the wall, it's a life-size figure. So if I was actually standing on the floor... We're going to get a shot of that right now, right too. We'll pull in. If I was standing on the floor, this is actual size. So you'll be able to get a sense of how large these, these figures are when you see this figure down here um, on the wall itself. So this is the section that he's going to paint. So that would bring us to day eight. You know, Monday would be probably the background and the portrait of the Indian Maiden, day nine. Um, and there's probably still another, you know, eight days after that, I think. It, you know, it, it just, we just hope that we can move through without any cutouts, and we'll just take it from there. We're on a real nice momentum right now, so we're just going to sort of stick with it. Because well, everybody great. else has a lot of work to do elsewhere, so we need, need to get this done. Well, the weather has held out really well in here, too. Um, Charles, uh, we are going to break in just a few minutes, about seven minutes. Okay, we do have some time left. If anybody wants to give us a phone call, 320-616-3240. I'll give you the web address in just a few minutes also. Actually, do you have Bill Angelos? Uh, that's the one we need to share with them also. Yes. Uh, when we give that web address, they'll be able to tap into that because it's linked to the website oh, okay. that I'll give them too. Okay. I'll tell them where to go on that. I don't have it written down, but I'll do that. Okay. Uh, Charles, right now you're mentioning some other things too that you are working on or possibly have worked on. What's on, in store for you uh, after this fresco is done when you, people go back to the real world and work on some other things? Where are you going to? Um, playing in my backyard. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, Is Roger going to play too? Yeah, we're going to, uh, we're going to like, uh, plant trees. No, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> no, uh, it's not the top mark, you know, I've got a studio, so I'm going to go into the studio and, uh, I've got several portraits to do, uh, some still life work. I, um, probably most noted for my still life work elsewhere, I have a lot of clients and collectors um, around the country and um, so I need to always have those pieces available on hand and, and with still life painting I like to also tell a story so I'm not necessarily just painting you know bowl of fruit with cloth etc 
I, uh, I like to work in the old 17th century Dutch theme called Vanitas, which deals with man's sort of mortality versus immortality, his um, arrogance versus non-arrogance, etc. So I work with a lot of pieces like that. And then again, portraits. Uh, I have several of those lined up. Then in the fall, I'll be heading back to North Carolina where Roger and I will um, assist Mr. Long on another fresco at Montreat College. And then during the winter months, I will begin preparing uh, some of the sketches. Actually, I'll probably do some this summer also, some of the sketches for the center section, which depending on how we are uh, financially next year, we would then execute that about the same time next year. So there's always something to do. There's never a dull moment. I think you need to plant a few trees first, though. Well, I do have uh, <laughs> my neighbors giving me six, so I will. <laughs> Charles, uh, compare this to other frescoes you've worked on. Size-wise, biggest, um, smallest, medium? No, this, this is one of the larger ones. I mean, the biggest one I've ever worked on would be uh, St. Peter's Catholic Church. I mean, a single fresco. That was um, 44 feet and went up 16 feet on the sides and peaked out at 33 feet. And that was uh, one of uh, Ben's first major compositions in downtown Charlotte. It was the Agni in the Garden, uh, the Resurrection, and the Pentecost. And then after that, we did three 18 by 23 foot pieces at Nations Bank in their corporate headquarters downtown Charlotte. Then there was a smaller one at uh, the Law Enforcement Center. I was not really involved a lot with that. And then most recently, we just finished a large dome in the new Transamerica building downtown Charlotte, which was 29 feet across by 14 and a half feet deep. And that was about 35 feet off the ground. So we had a real complex uh, scaffolding system set up to do that. Now. Again, those are all compositions by Mr. Long that Roger and I both assisted him on. And so Charlotte is sort of becoming a, a mecca for frescoes as far as, you know, on a monumental scale that the corporate uh, world, the public, and, and the church have all financed and, and uh, put together. It's kind of like uh, the old days when fresco was in Rome, too, correct? I mean, well, because Michelangelo was, was contracted. Right, exactly. You know, it's, uh, th there's a lot more happening both here in Minnesota and in North Carolina, which is really quite exciting. I mean, it's... It's interesting to see where it's going to go. Um, oh, yeah. I'm working on one possibly in a small church just outside of Raleigh, but that's, that's up in the wind yet. So that could happen within the next you know, two years. I've got one other great question that the kids asked. Are you a starving artist? <laughs> I think my answer was only when I'm in Little Falls. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, how much time do we have left here? We're going to cut it off in just a second. We thank you for joining us. Those of you that are out in uh, public TV land, we hope that you enjoyed this broadcast. We'll be rebroadcasting this on Channel 6, 63, and 3 later on this month. Uh, our web address for Little Falls Schools, I'm going to just say this because I don't have it written down anywhere, but it's www.lfalls, that's L-F-A-L-L-S, dot K-1-2, dot M-N, Dot US. And when you get to our home page, if you go up to the top corner, you're going to see something called What's New and What's Hot and Happening. If you click on What's New and What's Hot and Happening, you will see the first fresco project that Charles worked on, the stewardship project. I want to thank you once again. My name is Dave Gertz, the media tech person here at Lindbergh Elementary, integrating technology every day for you in Channel 6, 63, and 3. Come back and join us again. And I have to tell you one other thing. This looks much nicer in real life than it does on TV. We're located at 101 9th Street Southeast in Little Falls. If you want to visit Lindbergh Elementary anytime, you are welcome. The first fresco is visible from 9th Street and Broadway. Until next time, we all wish you good night. <laughs>